Oh, Elsa is here also. Hi everyone, I'm just letting um, people into the webinar at the moment, so I'll just give it a couple of minutes to allow everyone to join us. Okay, I can see the numbers going up now, so we'll just get started. So welcome to the first in our session um, on community buyouts through negotiation, avoiding the bumps in the road. So we've got three sessions happening today. Uh, and this session this morning is looking at idea to offer. I'm Lindsay Chalmers, I'm the development manager at Community Land Scotland, and I'll be chairing today's session. So um, just running you through a kind of quick introduction, and then, then I'll be chairing the Q&A session at the end. So the reason we want, why, why we wanted to run these sessions was that the majority of buyouts are through negotiation. Uh, it's often described as the simple process of uh, buying an asset, but that's perhaps a bit misleading because it's really completely straightforward. Um, for communities that are going through a purchase for the first time, the whole process can be a bit mysterious. So part of today's uh, purpose is to demystify that process. Um, so we'll be hearing from various people today from the National Lottery um, Community Fund, Scottish Land Fund team, Cal McLeod from Harper McLeod and Community Land Scotland. We've all worked with lots of communities and we're able to give some really useful tips for how the whole process will work. Um, so I'm just going to quick, quickly run you through a few housekeeping points. So perhaps the most important uh, thing to know is that the webinar is, is the same link for all three webinars today. Um, so if you're joining more than one of them, just use the same webinar link and we will ask you to all leave at the end of the first one and just rejoin if you're coming in at the 12 o'clock or the 2 o'clock one. Um, my colleague says that it's best if you leave voluntarily because if we have to remove you, um, apparently it's difficult to get back in again. So I remind everyone at the end of this session just to um, leave the webinar. And we'll be recording the webinar today. So if you want to share it with your um, colleagues, um, or if there's anything you want to refer back to, we'll have it up on our Vimeo site next week. We'll also be sharing the presentations on our website. Um, if you have any uh, questions, we'd ask that you put them in the Q&A box at the bottom. Uh, if there's any kind of really urgent points of clarification uh, during the presentation, you can ask those questions. But we ask that most of the Q&A happens at the end of the session after the presenters have finished speaking. If you want to ask your question of anyone in particular, just say who it is and we'll direct that question to them. So um, today we're going to have Rebecca Dundas and David Knight from the National Lottery Community Fund speaking first, and um, followed by Phil McLeod from Harper McLeod. So I'm just going to hand over to Rebecca and David just now. Thank you. Thanks, Lindsay. It's Rebecca here. Can everyone hear me, I hope? Uh, yes, we can hear you. That's great. Thanks, Lindsay, for confirming that. Now, is that the screen shared there? So, Looking thank good. Thank you for having us. Um, so just to introduce us, um, David and myself work for the National Lottery Community Fund, and we have been involved in running the Scottish Land Fund for well over eight years. So what we're going to be talking about today is our perspective and experience of negotiated sales um, from the, based on the experiences of the groups that we have worked with over the years. We're part of a broader team that's involved with the Scottish Land Fund. And um, one of my colleagues, Ellen, is also on the line today. So we're here and we can take questions at the end and, and talk about that. We are here to support groups through the process of applying for funding and working with that funding um, at, at all the stages of the process. Um, so we're going to talk you through initially what the Scottish Land Fund is, what funding is available at the moment, and what help and support is there. 
I mentioned that we're part of a broader team, and this is with Highlands and Islands Enterprise, because the Scottish Land Fund is a partnership fund. I'm just going to move on to the next slide. So it's Scottish um, government funding that's been available at £10 million a year, and the Community Fund is involved with the assessment and grant management side, and Highlands and Isles Enterprise are involved with supporting groups directly with their, their projects. So, we, why do groups get involved in buying assets? Um, we've seen lots of different reasons over the years, with uh, each story is unique to that community. So it can be about creating community spaces or hubs, uh, creating jobs in these communities, access to green spaces through woodlands or um, community growing type projects, a range of environmental activities. Housing is always important because that's, that's a real um, challenge for many communities or saving essential services within communities, such as the, the last shop or the last pub in the village. I'm going to talk through the Scottish Land Fund process. This is what we've currently got open at the moment and available for support. Um, but you may have heard that there's a new fund starting next year. Um, this programme still has to be evaluated the, the fund that we're currently working with still has to be evaluated and developed. So I'm talking on the basis of what we currently have. So if I can emphasize that there's still support there at the moment, the high team of case officers are still working with groups. We're still taking inquiries about potential projects um, and there's still the stage one funding available. So please don't think that everything's closed um, and unavailable. The, what is closed at the moment is the um, stage two acquisition funding. Move on to the next slide. So if you've got an idea about an asset that you want to develop in your community, one of the first steps would be to get in touch with us um, and talk to our funding officer team about the idea that you have and ex explain what the asset is, what the ideas you have, what, what your community group is and, and where you're taking it. And then the funding officer will advise if this is likely to be a Scottish Land Fund project and then do a referral on to the Highlands and Islands Enterprise team who will be able to help you with your specific project. The high team will also help you to develop your stage one application. This process is still open. There's still funding available for at stage one for things such as valuations or um, community engagement or um, doing business planning. Stage one application process is fairly straightforward um, and it's a, it's a quite a quick turnaround for you. So we've still got three meetings left for stage one, so there's still the funding there um, and you can get up to 30,000 towards your initial development costs for projects. Stage two funding, we've just had our last decision making meeting for stage two. So stage two for acquisition funding is currently closed and won't open up again until we get the new fund um, next year. So this is where groups have been, stage two is where groups have been able to apply for acquisition and legal costs and other costs like that. Um, we're going to talk more about what happens after you receive your funding. We'll be positive and say that you're receiving the acquisition funding. So we'll talk more about that later on in the next session. Um, I've only given you a very brief overview of the funding side of the process, but there's much more to acquiring an asset than the funding. So David will also briefly talk you through 
the route map to community ownership, which was developed by Community Land Scotland and provide examples uh, from groups that we've worked with over the years. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, as you can see on the screen, there's a very useful uh, route map to community land buyout. Now, since you've got the slide, it wasn't my intention to actually talk through every single bit of it, but to maybe highlight some of the areas where you need to pay particular attention, particularly at the beginning. Uh, but it's actually a really useful uh, guide that's been produced by Community Land Scotland, uh, which actually captures most of what you will come across. But part of this is, um, uh, webinar is obviously about the relationships side of things. And uh, I was going to spend a little bit of time on that, but first I would reiterate what Rebecca's already said is that um, uh, we've been doing this for quite some time now. And I would say there's two types of, uh, if you like, routes to acquisition, and I would call them planned or opportunist. Now a planned acquisition is where a community group have had uh, the opportunity of the time to perhaps undertake a community planning exercise or a planning for real or a charrette where they've just looked at the whole um, aspect of their particular community, what they like, what they don't like, and what the needs and aspirations of the community are. And as a result of that, have identified the need for an asset to deliver a particular activity or to address a particular need. And those are, from a funder's point of view, a really useful way of actually going through the process because you've not at that point got a particular building in mind. Um, unfortunately, that's not the most common uh, route. Uh, they're the ideal routes, but most are opportunist because uh, by the nature of the beast, the, the opportunity to acquire the asset has arisen at short notice. And this has become literally, it's, it's come on for sale. If you've already done your planning for real, it may well be that you then have got the ideal opportunity to follow it up and, and purchase a particular building that suits the needs. But again, when we're looking at the opportunist ones, we are talking about uh, the last or only significant asset within a village. And examples for that would be village shops, really good example. Uh, ones I would, uh, uh, we've dealt with are, for example, in Moor Battle in the Borders, uh, Broughton in the Borders, Dunshalt in Fife. And this is where it is the last remaining uh, shop that serves the community and clearly is an essential service. Other ones we've had are the last petrol station, uh, the last pub, uh, Gartmore and Dunlop. Uh, we've even had GP surgeries, uh, one in Fort Augustus and a recent application for one in uh, Glenluce. And then we go on to ones where the community have leased a building for use and it's well used by the community and the owner, be it the local authority or a private owner, uh, suddenly decides that they want to sell it and um, because it's such a valuable asset to the community, obviously there's interest in purchasing it. Then we can move on to significant green space or woodland areas, again well used by the community, often leased from uh, Forest and uh, Land Scotland. Um, who then decide to sell or the community can approach uh, the owner to ask if they would wish to sell it. Then we have the iconic type buildings and then that would be the Pyramid in Anderson or Strathpepper Pavilion where not only is it of historic and heritage value, it's an important economic driver within a community. And then we move on to land for the development of affordable housing and there are others, as I say, I could probably spend a good 20 minutes just going through that list. When it comes to relationships, 
right at the beginning, my advice would be if, if you've identified a property, the first thing you should do is actually approach the owner. Um, and uh, it's important to do this at a really early stage, even if the building is perhaps only one of the options that you are considering. And the reason for that is that I don't think you get off to a really good start if the owner finds out that the community is interested in buying it from gossip within the community or from chit chat on social media. So I think contact with the owner is really important at the beginning. And it's far better to have a willing seller and a negotiated sale than uh, to have to go through the requirements of perhaps community right to buy. You've also, when you're dealing with the owner, you've got to be realistic with them about the timescales that are going to be involved, unless you as an organization have a significant amount of reserves that you can purchase it without a funder, you're going to be working to a funder's timescale. And again, my experience uh, when I tell groups that um, at the early stages, we've often found it can take years from the point of having an idea about something to actually then acquiring the asset and moving into it. Can be quicker. We've had some that are a lot quicker than that, but I think you've got to be realistic with an owner about the time scale. Do, do not make the mistake of agreeing a price with an owner at a very early stage. And the reason for that is that uh, by all means, you might get an indication from the owner as to what kind of value they think in it, but don't sign up to anything. And I'm sure Callum will, will come on to the legal side of things later on, because often when you go for a valuation, they can quite often be a lot less than what the owner uh, would value the asset at themselves. And then you've got a problem about meeting the gap between what the owner's looking for and what you've had as a valuation. So don't sign up to anything at the beginning. Again, Callum will probably mention this, but it's always useful to know if the owner intends to put any conditions on the sale and this particularly applies to local authorities. And it's useful to find that out before you get any valuation done because conditions can uh, affect the value of a property when, when they're looking at the value of it. An example, an extreme example I would give is that I've had experience of an owner put a condition of sale that if ever a community wished to sell the property in the future without limit of time, it was to be sold back to the seller for the one pound that they were transferring it from. Now that sounds, the one pound purchase is, sounds like a great deal, but that effectively meant that that land um, was valued at one pound from that point on forevermore. And you would never be able to borrow funding for any development that you wanted to do because any funder seeing that condition would realize that that land's only worth a pound. The, the partnerships, I do want to talk about, and I'll spend just a little bit of time because I see we're, we're running out of time, is there are three relationships you need to develop. The first one I've mentioned is with the owner. The second one is with your community. And the communication is the key. Um, you need to be open and transparent with the community about what's happening. You need to keep them informed of your progress. I would suggest publish minutes of every meeting. You know, say, if concerns are raised, don't make the mistake of underestimating them or brushing them under the carpet. They need to be looked at, they need to be considered. And it's the kind of thing that a funder uh, such as uh, Scottish Land Fund when they're assessing an application will probably ask what concerns were raised and what did you do to try and mitigate or address the concerns. And finally, again, your funder is you could do a relationship with your funder. Uh, I would say take advantage of any support or any development funding that is on offer. 
Um, when you're coming to put your business plan together, be realistic in your projections about what you can what you can achieve, particularly from a financial point of view. And bear in mind that your funder has dealt with hundreds of projects, uh, read hundreds of business plans, and can spot unrealistic projections from a mile away. I'm sure there's going to be many questions that are raised, but I see we're at our time limit. So I'll hand back to Mutiland Scotland and thanks for listening. Thanks, David and Rebecca. That was really helpful. So we're going to pass on to Callum McLeod from Harper McLeod now to hear about the um, consultor's point of view. Callum has worked with many community landowners over the years. so. Hopefully those give us some really good top tips today. Over to you, Callum. Thanks, Lindsay, and uh, thanks to uh, Rebecca and David uh, for that. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen just now. Um, so hopefully everyone can see that and hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Yes, can see and hear. Yeah. So, uh, as uh, Lindsay said, I'm a solicitor at uh, Harper McLeod, um, and I do specialise in um, community buyouts and um, community purchases. Um, what we're going to focus on um, in this session is what what I'd almost call call phase one, if you like, of um, of a community purchase. Um, and that, that that would tend to be prior to entering into, you know, what you've probably heard described as the conveyancing process or prior to entering into any real formal contracts for the um, purchase and uh, purchase or, or leasing, I guess, of, of, a, of an asset. Um, solicitors would be involved potentially at certain steps in, the, in this process, albeit, you know, we wouldn't be involved in everything in the same way that we're going to touch on in the, um, in the second session at uh, tw 12 noon. Um, I think uh, David in particular gave a very useful wider overview of um, of the sort of things a community really needs to be thinking about. Um, but what, and I'm going to look at it a bit more from, from the legal perspective, um, but also touch on uh, various other issues that I see arising um, during this phase one, if you like. So when, when you're in the early stages, um, I think some of the initial things for a, for a community group to think about um, is firstly from a legal perspective, per perhaps the status of your body. Um, should you uh, incorporate? Uh, so would you set up a company or would you remain um, as an unincorporated or organization? Um, there's lots of various structures you could look at. I'm, I'm not going to go into the detail of that just now, um, but, but it's just something to think about. Um, this doesn't need to be done um, necessarily at the very start, but it, it's just something to think about, you know, when, when you're at the early stages. Um, and any uh, community body might think about going for charitable status again. Um, you don't need to, but again, something to start thinking about. Um, I think initially, pro probably most, most groups, unless they're already constituted, would, would stay as some form of pre preparatory group at, at the start. Um, that, that's actually the language that's used, used for it in the Community Land Scotland protocol. Um, and that's just, you know, I guess a loose group of volunteers uh, who, who, who've, who've got an idea. Um, I, would, I would really urge all groups to consult with the Community Land Scotland protocol. Um, yeah, I was involved in some of the legal aspects surrounding it, and and it, it's it's got a lot of a lot of detail in it, um, and there's some really good advice. I think the, the overall protocol, um, and it, it's a very useful step by step guide. 
to uh, negotiated transfer. The only one thing I, I would say is, you know, it's got a lot of detail and it gives a pathway to follow, but, but don't worry if, you, um, if you're doing things at different points from the protocol. Obviously consult with CLS, Scottish Land Fund, there's lots of available advice out there. And as, as uh, David Knight said, ha have your discussion with the landowners at an early stage. Um, it, it's, it's really going to make a, a difference to, to, to try and um, set, set the tone for a negotiated um, uh, for a negotiated uh, transfer if you're able to have an early discussion with the landowner. So in this negotiation feasibility stage, um, I, in, in my view, you're sort of concerned with a few things. Um, I, I think you, you're um, con concerned with funding for, for, for the overall, overall package, um, which is what, what we'll um, deal with in the, the next session, uh, which is phase two, when, when you're actually moving to acquiring the asset. Um, you know, you might be liaising with funders um, and you might be looking to get a valuation at some point. Um, from, from my perspective as a solicitor, I'm maybe not going to be um, deep, deeply involved in all of these things, but the things I, I would be concerned concerned about um, when I was, if I'm advising a community group, is I would be saying, well, look, you need to be looking to try and get an agreement in principle. Uh, so some form of agreement in principle uh, with the landowner, um, that's an absolute need. You need to be liaising with the funders, uh, especially SLF. Uh, and at some point in the process, probably later on, uh, you'd be looking to get a valuation and then it's at that point when you've done all of these things, you're, you're looking to move on. Um, if you get your funding approved and you move on to, to the real, I suppose, the legal process. So what, what do we mean by agreement in principle though? Um, well, I mean, I guess agreement in principle is, 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 is just that. It's a very simple agreement that's just in principle. It's not it's not binding, uh, it's not contractually binding on e either party. Um, and at a very basic level, it could be just a landowner saying, I'm agreeing to sell you that particular asset um, for a particular price. Um, ideally though, you know, too, too often we've seen maybe there being uh, loose discussions with a landowner um, and the uh, agreement um, isn't either detailed enough or isn't quite what it seemed. So I think um, ideally you want to get something that's perhaps a little bit more detailed and uh, something that is in writing, even if it's just an email from a landowner. Um, there's different forms this could take. Um, you, you, might, you might hear people talking about heads of terms. So what that is, um, again, they're non-binding, but uh, they would tend to be the main deal-making or, or deal-breaking points. Uh, normally price, key dates. Um, so normally you would be looking at a suggested date of entry. That, that's incredibly difficult actually for a, a, a community body to pinpoint early on, but you, you, you could look at you know, setting out how long you think the funding process may take. Um, obviously, the, the property being sold or the asset that's being transferred, um, you need some form of description on, on that. Um, you know, I've dealt with a community purchase recently where they hadn't properly described it and then there was disagreement over the extent. So, you know, if you can ideally pinpoint it with reference to a to a map or a plan that, that's really useful. Um, and also any special conditions that the landowner um, would be looking to impose, um, that, that, that can be really, really important. And that was a point David, David made as well, you know, if there's a condition about 
um, a right of the landowner to, ba to buy it back, that, that can have a, an impact later on in the process. Um, so these types of terms, as I was saying, you know, they're, they're just the basic terms, but they're not binding, don't get signed, you wouldn't be able to go to court or anything on the back of them, but they are really important. Another option is what we call as a memorandum of understanding. Um, again, it's, it's not binding in the sense that you wouldn't raise a court action on the back of it, but it, it's, it's perhaps a little bit more of a formal document. Um, and I would normally get it signed by both parties. Uh, it doesn't often, it's not often as detailed as heads of terms, but it's, it, it quite often might set out the process and saying both parties are working towards the sale um, of this particular property um, and say, saying that both parties are going to be in good faith and work together. Um, of, Often it could maybe distract from trying to get a more detailed agreement in place. So you wouldn't always use this memorandum of understanding. I think it's more important to get the main terms agreed. But but it's but it's quite useful where there's maybe a long going to be a long process ahead. Um, an example would be the purchase of crofting estate, a big rural estate where there's lots of mapping, um, and it can be quite useful as well um, if. You don't want to really finalise a price um, because, um, you know, in, in a negotiated purchase discussion with the landowner could be could be quite well advanced uh, in terms of how long you've been speaking with the landowner, but you're not able to finalise a, a price. So ideally, a memorandum of understanding. What I've done before with certain community buyouts is have a uh, just a condition there that. The, the parties will jointly agree a valuer or jointly agree to go to the uh, district valuer if, if, if appropriate and they'll, they'll agree the price that way. Um, sometimes, and uh, David usefully um, mentioned opportunistic purchases where, um, um, where, where you're maybe under a bit more time pressure. Uh, sometimes you might need to move to something a bit more formal and binding with the landowner or a bit more detailed. Uh, so you might need to bring forward the more formal contract, um, which uh, I'll discuss in detail more in the later session, um, but you might have to draft the full formal contract so the landowner can see it or give what, what's called a conditional offer. And, that, and that's much further than the agreement in principle. Uh, sometimes you would do that perhaps just because time and the opportunities are risen and you need to move quickly. Um, but also sometimes, uh, you know, if, if you're trying to do a negotiated purchase and if there's maybe a lack of trust between you and the owner and you feel you need something a bit more solid, you could, uh, you could move to that. Um, I, think, I think it's always worthwhile speaking to your advisor and solicitors, uh, you know, at this er early stage to see, well, what sort of agreement, if any, is appropriate here? Should you be trying to get something more formal or, or uh, should you just be trying to get something in principle with the landowner? Valuation. Um, so you're going to have to do a valuation for your funders at some point. Um, ideally, it would be great that both parties signed up to the valuation process and said, right, we'll agree a value between us and that, that will set the price. Either way, you know, you're going to need to do what's called an independent RICS valuation. Um, so that's, you know, the Registered Institute of Char Chartered Surveyors valuation, RICS valuation. Um, a point David made, um, what, what, what you've negotiated needs to be what, what, what you're valuing. So there's no sense in just getting a valuation too early and then find there's all sorts of restrictive clauses uh, in, in, in your in your deal. Um, ideally, a landowner could just agree a deal in principle with you but make it subject to valuation. And that, that, that's, that's probably quite important when you're dealing with a more complex sale of large rural properties and things, things like that, where there's a very, can be a long lead in time. Um, and yeah, you would, you would really want to wish to delay the valuation to as, to as late as possible. Um, because 
you know you want your you want your final final deal ideally negotiated and then put put to the value and say how do you value that um and always best check with the funders what their requir requirements are for valuation uh, so final thoughts um whilst whilst we're doing this in um two separate sessions um you know phase one and phase two if you like uh, you know you you shouldn't detach them uh, it's 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 all part of the same process uh, and you know speak speak to your advisors both at an early stage but um you know if there's advisors you think should only be involved in phase two that that doesn't mean you shouldn't speak to them at phase what phase one because what, what you do at phase one will impact on the on the final deal um some 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 flexibility is is required so don't, so don't worry if you're following a slightly slightly different path or doing doing things at different points um david mentioned planned buyouts and yeah they they, they, they are much easier to follow a sort of set path for for everyone involved but you know as i said uh, flexibility is required and um, most buyouts are opportunistic so uh, again, you might do things at different points and don't worry about that. And uh, final thought is that whilst we are meant to be encouraging negotiated sales, if you're an eligible community body, do not forget the community rights to buy. You might not need to use them, but they're a very useful negotiating tactic to put a wee community, community right to buy application in there. So thank you, and I'll pass you back to Lindsay just now um, for the any questions uh, and answers. Thanks, Carol. Lots of really useful tips in there. <laughs> so um, I think we've got questions for all of you. Um, perhaps the inevitable question is around costs and choosing um, a solicitor. So. Um, Rebecca or David, would you be able to run me through like, what your expectations are from a Scottish land? On the point of view in terms of how community would go about that process? Yeah, so inevitably the legal costs will depend upon the asset that's being acquired and the scale of it and the complexity of it. So we can see legal costs that range for a small asset for, you know, under a couple of thousand pounds up to a more complex asset where there's going to be significant conveyancing and work that might be 10 plus thousand pounds. Um, from experience, what we would absolutely suggest to groups is that the legal costs are negotiated in advance and that some community groups have found it helpful to have an upper level and so that the solicitor knows that in advance and knows what they can't go beyond because we have had a few groups where they have ended up with dreadful surprises with 50, 60,000 pounds in legal fees coming through. Now that's the exception rather than norm. And going back to what we were talking about earlier in terms of communications, communications with your professionals at every stage and managing expectations is important here. The Scottish Land Fund can and does support some of the legal fees and we can contribute up to 95% of those. So there is the, the funding there as part of your overall acquisition package at stage two to support that um, because we do recognise the important role that professionals play in these processes. Callum, is there anything that you would like to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I would, I would agree with everything that um, Re Rebecca says. I mean, I think it, the fees are going to very much depend on um, the asset and uh, what the complexity of the proposed transaction and you know it, 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 as, as Rebecca says it can be from less than 2,000 to you know potentially over 10,000 10, you know 10,000 10, bits would be the more complex um, rural estates um where there's huge mapping lots of leases cottages etc so um and you know more straightforward buyout would be clearly at, at the lower end um i think it, i think it you know not all the ones i've been involved in we, we, we tend to have been quite 
quite clear in advance on costs. I don't don't find it really helps helps us as solicitors to have clients who are not aware of what the costs are going to be. It's um, you know there's no sense in 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 that, um, and certainly everything I've been involved in, you you know you solicitor I've always been willing to give a sort of capped fee, and we know that there's going to be budget constraints. So um, I think I think the key word is is communication. I think um, sometimes maybe uh, community groups are reluctant to maybe speak to the solicitor at what I would describe at phase one when they're still negotiating things, and then they go and get the funding. They've already got their funding, and um, it's at that point they appoint a solicitor and um, the budgets then don't meet and um, or or they've not agreed a cap or it's you know it's, or it's even too too late to, to agree a cap so I, I think speak speak to people early um, and you know it gives the community groups a bit more time um, but but I think it also helps with any funding applications etc. Um, so yeah, I think it does come come down to speak, to speak to you know solicitor early just to, just to find out. You might not need to use them at phase at phase one at this stage, um, but um, it's still useful to speak to them to see what 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 the costs will be for the for the second for the second stage, the conveyancing stage. Um, a third question is for you as well, Callum. Um, could you expand on the statement about what you do at phase one and how that will impact on the deal? Uh, yeah, so, um, I mean, I, th I think this com comes down to trying to get agreement in principle um, because, you know, so someone might think they've got an agreement with a landowner, uh, so for a particular price. For, for example, um, and then they find they actually go to uh, to phase two, which is preparing the legal contract, and the landowner starts to want to impose uh, conditions that are um, could impact on, say, the valuation. So a classic example of that would be landowner trying to at a much later point in the process uh, impose um, a clawback which is where um, where if the community ever tries to sell part they need to repay a sum to the landowner or um, I've also seen um, quite quite late on in the process um, rights of first refusal if there's ever Ever a, a sale, um, what, what, what David was mentioning, trying trying to be imposed. Um, so I think it's to try and get a bit of clarity that that there's not going to be surprises of that nature later on in the in the process because these types of things all impact on your valuation. And a valuer might have gone out and just said, right, uh, I'm valuing that property and they'll value it on the basis that there's not going to be any special conditions of that nature, conditions that would affect valuation. Um, and you might have got funding secured on the basis of that valuation. And then if, you know, the landowner, because you've not had that sort of clarity with the landowner of, what, of, of the exact terms of the, of the, of the sale, um, that, that could really upset things later on. Um, I, I mean, I take, take the point is you're not going to get in a binding agreement, so that could happen anyway. But I think, you know, try, trying to get as much as you can agreed in principle is 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 helpful. Um, a very specific question about whether you wait for receipt of funding before you would expect to be paid as a solicitor. Oh, we've lost you. Lost your sound, uh... Yeah, go on. Yeah, it's just, it, was, it was about like whether you, you, I suppose, when you invoice that you wait for the funding to come into the community before you would expect to get payment for it. Well, well, normally, I mean, the bulk of the legal work is normally done at phase, phase two anyway. Um, you know, the initial phase is often it's, 
you know, and there might be a little bit of a discussion on what should be in the heads of terms. Um, and so, yeah, no, normally we just wait until the SLF funding was in place because that is actually the bulk of the legal work then anyway. So, yeah, normally it would be invoiced at the point of, um, at the point of uh, funding. I think, I mean, from a community law Scotland point of view, that's one thing you'd want to check when you were getting quotes from solicitors that what the payment expectation would be. Yeah, I mean, it's, I've, I've not, I don't think I've ever had a case where it's not been funded, to be honest. Um, yeah. I'm going to direct the next question to Rebecca, which is about the importance of engaging a solicitor with community land purchases, and um, maybe you could give us some insight into kind of pros and cons of that. I mean, you, there you'll need to, everyone will need to engage a solicitor at some point in that process, but what are the pros and cons of engaging a solicitor early on? So I think it depends on the asset that's being acquired, the complexity of it, and the skills and experiences within your community group at which stage you would want to engage with your solicitor um, so that that's something for each each group to determine themselves the i mentioned earlier that there is some initial funding for developing your plans at stage one and a small number of groups have come in for legal costs at that stage um, because they perhaps have a particularly complex asset that they want to get legal advice on at that stage and look into it as part of the due diligence that they're undertaking. Uh, but it wouldn't be the, the norm at that stage to do that. Um, your solicitor is part of your professional support team that you would have around you from your Highlands and Islands case officer through to other advisors, depending on the type of asset that, that you're acquiring. Um, so they're, they're part of your team and we would always recommend getting professional advice there. Um, this is a serious undertaking that's being made by the community to own an asset and you, you want to get it right from the start. I think I've misunderstood Graham's question as well, having he's just reframed it um, about whether you should employ a solicitor who's got experience in community land purchase. Um, again, Rebecca, it'd be good to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, with over what, 250 acquisitions having gone through in the last six, seven years, there's a lot of solicitors out there like Callum and others who have experience of acquisitions. So it'll partly depend where you are in the country and um, what solicitors are available and what experience they've got. Um, so that's something that you would look into at that early phase to find out who's available locally. Community Land Scotland and other community groups potentially can advise on who groups have worked with. And we would certainly recommend that groups speak to others who've done similar things and share that experience. Um, okay. Another one for you, Rebecca, this is a bit of a tricky one. I but, think um... Callum's looking to come in there. Yeah, I, I, I was just going to going to say I think there's a distinction between actually engaging a solicitor to do work, which will be most specifically um, at you know the, the phase two phase, phase two um, when you're doing the offer and um, and conveyancing, and that that's what you you will almost certainly get funding for. Um, and Rebecca's correct, correct that, you know, in, mo in most purchases, um, that's what you'll probably only need to really engage a solicitor to do. But I still think it's important to speak to a solicitor. I, I can't speak, speak for all solicitors, but, you know, in my experience, I would much rather a group, even if they're only going to instruct me to actually do work, work that's actually chargeable in a, you know, a year, a year and a half's time, I would much rather they, they come and speak to me. Um, I get a sense of what's happening. Um, the chances are they're not going to need me to input, but I can tell them, look, you want to get these things agreed. Uh, um, you know, it's only a half hour bit of, bit of advice. Um, you know, I wouldn't normally charge charge for that if it was just laying a bit of groundwork. I know that actually 
me doing that is actually then going to help the process later on um, if the group's clear what, what they need to do. And then if they find they are having difficulties um, and they're needing more specific advice because there's some complexities, if there's something really detailed coming back from the landowner, then they can look at engaging more formally at phase one. But, but I think, you know, I think maybe there's this fear factor that just because you phone a solicitor up to discuss with them, you're immediately going to get, get a bill. Um, that, that, that's not, not, not the case, or it shouldn't, shouldn't be the case. <laughs> uh, at, at least I, I wouldn't tend to do that. I would much rather just a quick, even if it's a quick half hour talk to discuss some of the issues I'm discussing just now and saying, well, look at this point, this is what you're going to be doing. And at this point, you, you know, an example might be, you know, if someone's going for SLF funding, for example, I'll be able to tell them, don't forget to get funding for, I don't know, mapping costs, because some assets will require, um, I've worked with groups and they didn't, you know, they got funding from mapping costs, but they, they got it at the wrong time and then they, yeah, you, you know, almost got, 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 got sort of stuck. So it's always really useful to, just even have that sort of basic discussion to see where the groups are um, and even identify if advice is required. Um, that doesn't actually mean you have to engage the solicitor to, to do work. Thanks, Callum. Um, next question is about whether a local solicitor might work for a community group for free. So maybe, Rebecca, what is your experience of, of that? Sorry, sorry, Lindsay, I didn't hear the full question. Um, might a local solicitor work for a local community group for free? Do you ever come across a situation? <laughs> so we do see occasionally pro bono work, but it is not the norm. Um, and particularly where funders are saying that they will support the, the legal fees, there wouldn't be an expectation. But it just as on occasion, we've seen some community groups who've got pro bono work for business planning or community engagement work. It, it does happen occasionally, but our expectation would be to see legal costs in there and having a, a contract or an agreement with your solicitor that you know what work they're going to undertake and what work's going to be involved for a certain fee. Thanks, Rebecca. I've been involved in the community by it myself. I was joking with a solicitor, they ended up getting paid about one pound an hour because I was, ended up being so much more complicated than we thought it was going to be. So, um, although we did pay him, we, you know, I think sometimes solicitors can be really helpful in kind of giving guidance around the margins of what you're paying them for. Um, do you have a list of specialists at the Scottish Land Fund? I guess so, those people that can give advice. Yeah, so no, we don't have a, a list of people, but what we do know is that there's lots of groups out there who've worked with different suppliers. So your high case officer is the person who will give you the bespoke advice about your project and would be able to say, if you're looking at a community shop, for example, to speak to them, this advisor or that advisor or to um, try and speak to community groups who've been through the process and they will be very upfront about who they've used and who can help. Thank you. Um, if anyone else has got any questions, do feel free to text them into Q&A. Um, I just had a quick question of Callum about um, that kind of the timing issue of, um, you know, it'd be, it's a different process from buying a house or something because you're negotiating with the owner um, before you have funding in place and at what time you should be doing things like, like making verbal agreements with the owner. Is it, is, it ever, is it ever advisable to have a kind of verbal agreement with the owner that they will get paid a certain amount subject to funding being received or is it safer to write things down before it gets to the, the actual offer stage? Well, it's, it's, a, it's always safer to have something um in writing whether it's email um or whether it's some um, more um you know formal formal agreement even if that's non-binding and you know what i was describing earlier is the heads of terms and memorandum of understanding um you know both forms of sort of agreements but ultimately they're just uh, you know non-binding agreements um so if you don't get the funding you're not committed to anything um, I, th I think 
you know, in, t in terms of making an actual offer for, for, for price, if you can delay doing that until you've got a valuation, um, then, you know, that's the point David made earlier, and, you know, that's the point I, I, I was making as well, that, you know, valuation ideally is going to be later on in the process, um, it, 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 you know, for, for a few reasons, you know, you're going to have to get, get the costs of evaluation, um, uh, so you might require funding for that. Um, you're going to have to make progress with your funders uh, and, you know, any valuation is going to have to satisfy your funders' requirements as well. Um, and, and the fin final thing is, you know, you need to make sure you, you're, as I said, you're, you're valuing what, what, what you're actually purchasing. And that, and that includes all the, uh, any special terms and conditions that are, are included in the, um, in, in, in the sale. Um, so ideally, if you can put off agreeing a price until you've got a valuation, that, 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 would, be, that would be the preferred route. I, I also recognise that's not always possible. Um, and I'll, I'll maybe touch on this more in the next session, but sometimes you might just need to make either a uh, an agreement in principle that's subject to valuation where you actually uh, have a price set out and say you're willing to pay this price subject to valuation. Um, it's not ideal, but sometimes the opportunity requires it. Um, or alternatively, you might need to go the whole hog and actually enter into a full binding legal written contract that is subject to valuation. Um, as I said, I'll, I'll touch on what, how you could do that in the next session. Thanks, Callum. And I'll just take one last question as I'm aware of the time. Um, I think this one would be for you, Rebecca. Um, if you're going through the community right to buy process, can you claim for legal costs associated with that? Okay, so this is one that we would definitely pick up on um, you know, case by case basis because the, the community right to buy process has specific requirements and um, if they're getting involved, they may contribute some of the costs. So that is something that we would look at on an individual basis. Um, and we may have further clarification on that approach in the next fund. So that's one that we might need to come back to groups on for those small number of cases that are using community right to buy. Okay, thank you, Rebecca. So yeah, a massive thanks to Rebecca, David and Callum for um, talking us through this first session. And we'll be back at midday to look at what happens after offer to the run up to the point where you actually own the asset. Um, and I can, can I just ask everyone again if they could hit the leave button and then click back in through the link at 12 o'clock if we're coming to the next session or the two o'clock session. Thank you and we'll see, hopefully see you then.